calling all cars. The copyrighted program created by Rio Grande. Long Beach Police calling all cars. Attention all cars. Broadcast 237 at 120 East 1st Street. Assistant officer. And that's all. Rose and Cliff. The man who appraises your car for a trade-in not only looks at your car, he listens as well. And believe me, at a moment like that, you thank your lucky stars you've been protecting its inner workings, prolonging its life with real lube, the lubricant that keeps a new motor young and a veteran vehicle from growing old before its time. I tell you, friends, real lube not only safeguards the family car from unnecessary wear and tear, but brings it to the judgment day of a trade-in clear of conscience and unashamed. Thanks to this great lubricant, your motor never gives in to the degrading influences of intense heat generated by your fastest driving in the hottest weather. Real Lube places a protective arm about every vital point, and the demons of heat haven't a chance. If your car has been associating with ragtag and bobtail lubricants that threaten to take it for the wrong kind of a ride, give it a new environment. Give it a clean bill of health with Real Lube, the newest and finest motor oil sold in the West. The story we are to hear tonight was taken from the confidential files of the Long Beach Police Department. And it is our privilege to present Captain Walter Lentz, Chief of the Long Beach Detective Bureau. Captain Lentz. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have long agreed with the thesis set forth by this program, the theory that crime does not pay. The criminal is a serious danger because the rest of us do not take him seriously. If we realize that crime comes home to every man of us, and not merely to the victim alone, we would take crime more seriously. Our defense against crime is too casual. More and more, the law enforcement agencies of our country are realizing this fact and are cooperating to bring about a tighter enforcement of our laws. Programs of the sort we are to hear tonight make more vivid the work of the police in apprehending and punishing criminals who defy the law. Such cooperation is invaluable. Our program shall show how it worked to prove again that crime is a losing proposition. A hot noonday sun beat down on patrolman William McLean as he stood watching a swarthy-faced man sitting idly inside a shop on Ocean Boulevard in Long Beach. The milling crowd of shoppers went unheeded and traffic snarled on the corner, but Officer McLean kept the man in sight. Hello, Bill. What are you doing over here? Thought you were on traffic these days. I am, Calvin. I'm watching a fellow in that shoe shine parlor. I'm going to pick him up when he comes out. Where is he? You see that dark complexioned fellow sitting on that chair just by the door? Yeah. Tough looking customer, isn't he? Mm, pretty mean looking, all right. What's he done? Passed a forged check. Is that all? That's enough for me to pick him up. Well, why don't you go in and get him? I've got to keep my eye on the traffic out here. He'll be coming out in a minute. Sooner than that. Here he comes now. Well, I might as well take him in. See you later, Bill. Uh, just a minute, buddy. I'd like to talk to you. Yeah? What's the beef, copper? We'll talk about that at the station. You want to come along quietly, or shall I use the bracelet? Sure, I'll go with you. I ain't done nothing. Keep the cuffs in your pocket. All right, let's go. What's the idea of parking there? Come back here! Hey, stop that man! Stop! Get that man! Stop him! Hey, you! You see a man come through this alley? Yes, sir. He went into that hotel right there. Thanks. Oh, I'll be the laughing stock of the force if I let that guy get away with this. <clears throat> Say, lady, did you see a dark guy come in here a second ago? Oh, yes. Where is he? Well, back there, room 18. You better be careful, though. I will. He looked pretty desperate when he came in. Open up in there. Come on, I said, open up. Oh, oh. Here, Sean. Give me a hand here. Okay, Dilts. Easy now. There we are. Oh, he shot him. They didn't give him any chance at all. Dilts, look. It's McLean. You're right. Bill. Bill. No, it's no use, Ed. Poor guy. Bill was a swell fellow. Oh, that man ran in here, and when the officer made him open the door, he shot him. The officer never had any chance at Who all. Who did this? 
Sam Godanio, the man who lived in number 18. Maybe you'd better tell us all about it. Well, I, I was sweeping the hall here when I heard someone come running up the stairs. I went to the top to see who, who it was, and this fellow rushed up and shoved me to one side and went on back to his room. Do you know this man? Well, I rented a room to him yesterday, and I know the name he signed on the register, but that's all I know about him. Did he say anything when he came upstairs? He told me to get out of his way, and he shoved me aside and kept on running. What happened then? Well, just a second or two later, the officer, Mr. McLean, came running up the steps and asked me if a man came in here, and I told him where the fellow was. Did the officer have his gun in his hand? Well, I think so. Did this other fellow have a gun? Well, not when he came in, but evidently he had one in his room, because when the officer went back and told him to open the door, that fellow just stuck his hand out and shot Mr. McLean. Where'd he go then? Well, he started down the back stair, but the officer had fallen down there, so he came out this way. I saw him coming, and I ran into the bathroom, but I was afraid he'd come in there, so I ran down the hall toward the officer, and this fellow had a gun in his hand, a little shot sort of gun. And he ran out the front door. I ran back here to see if the officer was hurt. And, well, about that time, you men came. You say this man came here yesterday? Yes, sir. Have any baggage? Well, he had a suitcase, but it's not in his room now. What would you say his name is? Sam Godanio, the way he signed the register. Well, how did he act when he came in yesterday? Well, he seemed a little irritable. He told me he didn't have much money. Wanted to pay only 50 cents on the room, and he'd have some more money today. He said he was from Salt Lake City and he was a prize fighter. What kind of a looking fellow was he? Well, he looked like some foreigner to me. But his face gave me the creeps. You know, I'll never forget that face as long as I live. It was dark with heavy creases all along his mouth. And he had awfully dark eyes, sort of piercing eyes. How is he dressed? Well, he had on dark pants, I believe. Yes, I'm sure of it. And he wore a dark turtleneck sweater. You know, the kind you have to pull on over your head. And he wore a coat of the same material as the pants. Any hat? No, I never saw him with any hat on. He had a lot of hair, real black and sort of curly. All right, lady, thanks. We'd like to take that register of yours along to headquarters and have a photostatic copy of that handwriting made. Well, that's all right, but I want it back, though. You'll get it back. We just want a picture of it. I have an idea we're going to need that handwriting. Police headquarters bustled with activity. Crowds choked the hallway, seeking information about the slayer of the popular police officer. In a nearby room, the voice of the police announcer droned an endless description of the killer. Officers hurried from department to department, compiling all available information regarding the suspected murderer. Throughout the city, police swung into action. Police cars darted from their positions at the curb, speeding to effect the blockade of all avenues of escape from the city. Plain clothes men were rushed to bus and railway stations to watch every person leaving Long Beach. Radio stations cut short their broadcasts to tell the anxious listeners the latest developments in the manhunt and to warn citizens to be on the lookout for the killer. Thus, Long Beach sought the murderer of William McLean. In his office, Chief of Police Joe McClellan talked to two of his officers. Duffy, you're in charge of traffic? Yes, sir. McLean was on traffic, wasn't he? Yes, sir. Well, who was this fellow he was bringing in, and what did he want him for? We haven't the slightest idea, Chief. McLean was handling traffic and nothing else. Who the fellow was or why Mac picked him up is a mystery to me. How about you, Murphy? What do you know about this? Absolutely nothing, Chief. I haven't the slightest idea who the man was or why Mac was after him. It might be that somebody tipped Mac off that this man was wanted. Have you checked your bulletins for him? We haven't anybody in the mug books or on the wanted circulars that answer his description. And that's all we know about the case, eh? That's about the sum of it. Well, we've got to find out more about this, and we're going to do it. Murphy, that's your job. Well? Find out who that bird is who shot McLean and why he shot him, and bring the rat in. Okay. Send Lance and Fridley in here. Yes, sir. You want us, Captain? Yes, sit down. We're going to do something about the bird who killed McLean. Any idea who he is? Not the slightest. I want you to take Fridley here and go over that place where Mac was shot. See what you can find out. Talk to everybody on Ocean Boulevard and Purse Street if you have to, but find something we can work on. Okay. Yes? Okay, send him in. Something up? I can't tell. Front desk said somebody's coming in here who knows something about the case. Come in. Captain Murphy? I'm Murphy. My name is Calvin. I want you to sit down. Thanks. What can we do for you? Oh, pardon me. This is Lieutenant Lance and Sergeant Fridley. How, How do you do, do? Yeah. Sergeant? I, I thought maybe I could help you a little on this shooting case. Fine. Let's have it. Well, I was talking to Mac just before you arrested this fellow this morning, 
And I got a good look at the man. And uh, did McLean say anything about why he was picking this fellow up? Yes, he said something about him being a forger. Tell you where these checks have been cashed? No, he didn't. Where was this man when you first saw him? In the shoe shining stand on Ocean Boulevard. Do you think you'd recognize him if you saw him again? And how. He was one of the toughest looking guys I ever saw. Well, what happened when McLean picked this bird up? Well, we stood there talking a little while. And when we saw this fellow start to leave, I stepped back into a store there, and McLean went out and stopped him. Yeah? Uh, I couldn't hear what he said to him, but they started walking down the street toward Pine. Yeah? All of a sudden, some fellow bumped his car into another one that was double parked there by the corner, and the guy McLean had hold of broke away and ran up the alley with Mac right behind him. Did <laughs> McLean shoot at him? No. He fired in the air a couple of times, but the fellow kept on going up the alley. When he got to the corner, that is, out on First Street, yeah. I saw him turn the corner to the right. And that's the last I saw him. You didn't see McLean shoot at the man, did you? No, there was a couple of girls coming down the alley about that time, and a guy was parking a car on the lot that opens on the alley. They were all in the way. McLean wouldn't be shooting like that in the center of town anyway. Well, that's all I know about the case. Yeah, okay. I sure hope you'll catch that bird. He's plenty tough. Apparently. Well, Lentz, you and Fridley hop out and see what you can find out around Pine and Ocean. Twenty minutes later, the officers returned. With them were two frightened men. Well, Captain Murphy, yeah. there are a couple of fellows who can be of a little assistance to us. Yes? Who are they? They're the boys who run the shine stand on Ocean, where our killers started out from. What do you boys know about this? We don't know a thing. Honest, Captain, we don't know a thing about this. All right, now sit down, boys. Take it easy. We're not after you for anything. Suppose you tell us what this is all about. Oh, honest. We don't got nothing to do with this thing. We tell you the truth. Yeah, now look here, boys. We're not blaming you fellows for anything. Nobody's going to hurt you, unless you've had a hand in this killing. If you have, it's going to be plenty tough on you. Oh, no. We've we got nothing to do with this. Do with this. Yes. Oh, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute now. One at a time. Yes. yes. Now, suppose you tell us what this is all about. Wait a minute. Where's, where's Fridley? Oh, over at the hotel, getting what he can out of that room. Okay, you two. Start telling us. You tell him, Steve. No. You tell him. Oh, Bill. cut out the Alphonse and gas and stuff and get started. Well, it was like this. Last of July, Mr. Strauss... He comes Mr. to me and he Who, says... Who's Mr. Trost? Oh, he's the druggist on the corner. Yeah, I know. Uh, go ahead. Well, Mr. Trost, he comes to my stand and he say, Billy, say, you remember that fellow? Remember that fellow you told uh, he was okay, the one that wanted to cash that check? You mean that chunky guy with the black curly hair? That's the one. Hey, wait a minute, Mr. Trost. I didn't tell you this guy was all right. I tell you he come into my shop one or two times. I told you he see him around the street all the time, but I, I didn't tell you he was all right. All right. Now, just the same, the check I cashed for him wasn't any good. Is that right? Yes, that's right. And when he comes in here again, you call me or a cop. And which one he wanted me to do, call you or a cop? Now, that makes no difference to me. He forged somebody's name to that check, and I want him arrested. If you can't find me, call Bill McLean. And he'll take him over to the station. I'll sign a complaint against him when they get him over there. Okay, I'll call you. I say, I'll call you. Then one day, I see this fellow. He came into my shine stand. No, our shine stand. Sure, our shine stand. And he said to me, he say, I show it, our tricks. What do you mean, the tricks? I don't play no tricks. Oh, you know what I mean. Uh, hello. Hi, fella. Saw you over the place I lived, didn't I? Sure, I live there, too. Yeah, well, I'll move. Oh, that suits me fine. All joking aside, though. Where's a good place to stay around here? Oh, there's a hotel right on the corner, right up the alley on First Street. Well, I'll try it. Have you been going someplace? Yeah, I've been up in Frisco a while. What you do, eh? Uh, fight a little, wrestle some, uh -huh. just about anything. You want to shine? Yeah. Hey, Steve, you shine the gentleman's shoes. I'll go and get a cup of coffee. Coffee? Hey, what the heck? Hey, you shine the shoes. I get to get a cup of coffee at the drugstore. Oh, okay, okay, I shine. I'll be right back. So I run to the drugstore and I tell Mr. Trost that that fellow is in my shop. Our shop? Sure, our shop. I say the fellow who cashed the check, he came back. And what did Trust do? He say, see if you can find an officer. Did you find one? No. Officer McLean went to lunch, and nobody was in his place. Mm -hmm. What happened then? When I got to the stand, the fellow was just leaving. He said he'd come back in a day or two. So we just let him go. Uh, is that right, Steve? Sure. We tell the truth now. Uh, when did you see this fellow next? He came back again the next day, about the same time. This time he was dressed up different, though. Yeah, how's that? Uh, he had a black sweater, like a prize fighter. You know, a pull-down sweater. You mean pull over? Sure. That's what he means. He don't speak good English so good. What do you mean I don't speak a good English? I do all the talking. What do you do? Oh, cut out the squabbling. Now, uh, how is this bird dressed? 
I era swearer. Some darker pants and a coat. No oh. shirt. No hat. No shine. What happened then? I say to Steve, I say, Steve, you shine at the gentleman's shoes. I go next door for a cup of coffee. Both time I shine shoes, he go for coffee. Uh, what did you do then? I run the next door to see Officer McLean eating in his lawn. Yeah. I go in and I tell her that that fellow is in my stand now. Did McLean come out with you? No, he say, go back and act like if nothing happened. And I'll come in and get him. Uh, what did you say to that? I say, no, you know, take him in my shop. You wait until he comes out. I don't want any trouble in my shop. Our shop! All right! Hey, listen, shop. listen, you say that again, Steve, and I'm going to throw something at you. Okay. Go on, Bill. Well... When Steve got through shining this guy's shoe, yeah. he got up and he started out of the, of the shop. Yeah. I saw Mr. McLean standing down the street watching him. This fellow walked along looking in the window. And then Officer McLean walked up to him and he said something. Mm -hmm. I couldn't hear what he was. But pretty soon I seen this fellow uh, start to run. Which way? He ran up the alley. Officer McLean right behind him. He, he, he yelled, stop, one, two, three, uh, two, three times. And then he shoot. At the man? I don't know. I stayed in the shop. Uh, did you see anything else? No, that's all. Oh, hello, Fridley. What'd you find? Well, a killer used a thirty-two automatic. Mm -hmm. Shot at least three times. Missed once. Didn't leave anything to go by. That is not much. And once. Here are the empty shells I picked up in the hall. Here are the pieces of the banister and wall paneling where the bullets lodged. Mm. Cut them out with a chisel. Nice work. Did you get any prints? Not many. Got some pretty good ones off the bedpost. Brought back an empty whiskey bottle and might turn up a few. Chances are pretty slim that we've got anything on these prints. According to Bill here, our boyfriend came from the north. He's been here before, however. Maybe San Francisco. Some of the boys up around there have something on this fellow. Yeah, very likely. But we haven't the slightest idea who he is or where to look for him. Just before I went out, I got a notation the desk sergeant had made about a call from a cleaning shop on East 1st. Yeah? You think Walter here and I ought to take a look at it? Oh, you might as well. It may be a lead. We'll take a run over there and see what it's all about. <laughs> Somebody from here telephoned the police department? Yes, I did. What's the trouble? That man showed up here again. What man? The one I phoned about. What about him? Well, he came in here yesterday and brought some shirts and wanted me to get them out the same day. Well, I told him I couldn't do it, and he got kind of rough. Well, he came back just after lunch and said that he wanted to change his clothes. He had a suitcase with him, and I told him I couldn't let him do that. And he told me he'd blow my head off if I didn't let him. Do you have a gun? Well, I don't know, but I wasn't going to take any chances. I told him to go on back there and change his duds. Did he change? Yes. And he left his old clothes here. Here they are. There's a black sweater and a coat. Now, wait a minute. Take a look at those, Fredley. That's what I'm doing. Was this fellow uh, a sort of short, very dark man with black, curly hair? Yes. Uh, why? Well, nothing. He just shot a policeman about three hours ago. Here's a cleaning mark. See, over 1934. I'm going to take that coat and make the rounds of every cleaning place in this town. <laughs> Ever see this coat before? I don't think so. No fellow named Sam Gordanio? Never heard of him. You ever see this coat before? No. No Sam Gordanio? No. You ever see this coat before? No. Ever hear of Sam Gordanio? No. Did you ever see this coat before? Uh, I, I don't think so. No Sam Gordonio, short, dark fellow, curly black hair? Oh, him. I think I know who you mean. Yeah? A fellow like that was in here last night. Said he was from Salt Lake City. I told him a second-hand suitcase I had lying around here. <laughs> he said he was a boxer. Far into the night, Lentz checked shop after shop, always meeting with the same answer. At last, he decided his task was hopeless for only a few shops remained unchecked. Discouraged, he began his usual round of questions. Did you ever see this coat before? Yeah. You have? Sure, I've seen it. I pressed it about two days ago. You know Sam Gordanio? Yeah. He was here earlier today, asking me to keep the suitcase for him. I've got it right here under the counter. Well, uh, let me see it. Okay. Here you are. Well, boy, say, this is a break at last. Uh, what did this Gordanio look like? Oh, uh, sort of short, heavy set fellow. Very dark. Might be Greek or Armenian. Yeah? Had deep lines in his face, especially on the right side. Had black, curly hair. That's the bird. Huh. 
Don't look like he left much in that suitcase. No, just a shirt, a hat, and an empty whiskey bottle, which will probably break his neck. Lance and Fredley had gathered all the information they could in Long Beach. Captain Murphy now turned the case over to Sergeants Wood and Guthrow for further investigation. Reasoning that a criminal skilled in the art of forgery would not readily drop his practice, Wood and Guthrow determined to follow the trail of worthless checks that Gordonio was certain to leave behind. In the next few weeks, they were to learn that the trail stretched from one end of the state to another. A well-marked line of checks stretched from Long Beach to Fresno. Here, then, was a picture of a killer, a man who changed his name and his field of operations with equal frequency. Relentlessly, the officers pursued this man whose outstanding characteristic was a willingness to kill and kill quickly when cornered. Thus, the search for the killer of William Lean came to a dead end. We turn back the clock now six months. Our scene is an all-night market in San Francisco. Okay, buddy, get him up. This is a stick-up. Don't shoot, mister. Don't Stop shoot. squawking and give me that jack in the till. Show, get that dough. This bird's too shaky to stand up. Okay, Harry, coming up. Come on, make it snappy. Hey, Harry, there's a car stopping in front. Let's swim. Come on. It's cops. Beat it, Harry. Nuts to him. I'll blast my way through him. How you like this, Clark? In the excitement which followed the encounter, the short, swarthy bandit escaped in the fog. His companion was taken to headquarters and grilled. I tell you, that's all I know about the guy. He come up here with a dame from L.A. That was her car we was driving. Uh, who was the other man? Uh, the one who did the shooting? Well, well, his name was Katz. At least that's what I know him by. Sometimes, so he went by the name of Herman. Yeah, Frenchy Herman, too. And uh, his real name, though, was A-Rex. Harry A-Rex. Yeah? Who is this girl? I tell you, I don't know. You'll find her name in that there little notebook they found in our room. She's Harry's girlfriend. She comes from uh, Salt Lake, I think. Where'd this air rex come from? I don't know. Somewhere around Fresno. Okay, Shell. We'll content ourselves with putting you away for the present. We'll take care of Mr. A-Rex later. San Francisco police sent Mr. Shell to Folsom and with quickness and dispatch began the search for his companion in crime. To all points within the state went the bulletin. Be on the lookout for bandit described as dark complexion, five feet, five inches tall, weighs about 140 to 150 pounds, hair dark and curly, sharp facial lines. Believe suspect will attempt to contact Ruth Queen, Cora Street, Los Angeles, or Long Beach. Use extreme caution. Suspect is armed and dangerous. Long Beach police were quick to recognize in this description that of the fugitive wanted by their own department. And while San Francisco's case had reached a dead end, Long Beach began anew the task of tracking down their man. At Fresno, police learned that Harry Arax was known, had participated in the famous Bunyan Derby of 1927. The files of the Fresno Bee yielded a pile of pictures, and armed with these, Wood and Guthrow returned to Long Beach to show the pictures to witnesses. That's the man, all right. That's the man. I know that face anywhere. That's the man that came to my shop. That's the bird that cashed that check. He's the same one that changed clothes in my store. That's the man. I'll never forget that face. He's the man. So the case again came to a dead end. Routine investigation continued, but the trail disappeared. Occasional tips sent Long Beach officers scurrying to capture the elusive gunman, only to have him slip through their fingers. On the afternoon of April 10th, 1935, a bulletin was placed on the bulletin board in the office of the sheriff of Laramie County at Cheyenne, Wyoming. A man paused to look at the new bulletin. Hmm, just a paper hanger at work, eh, Glenn? Well, no, maybe you're right at that, Franson. But that bird there is a paper hanger, not me. What's he done? Started out as a paper hanger. You know, bad check artist. Ended up by murdering a policeman in Long Beach, California. Tough-looking monkey, isn't he? Looks familiar, too. Too tough for deputy county treasures like you. <laughs> you go on and count your money. Let us catch the criminals. Yeah. That's an idea you might give some thought to yourself. Mm -hmm. Just the same, I've seen that bird somewhere. Franson, you read too many detective stories. I've got it. What? That's the dishwasher at the Star Cafe. Come on, I'll show you. Hold on a minute. You mean that bird's in this town? That's what I'm telling you. He's washing dishes at the Star Cafe. Uh, I don't believe it, but uh, let's go see. Hey, uh, Holman. Yeah? I'm going down to the Star Cafe. 
If I'm not back in ten minutes, drive down there and pick us up. Okay, Sheriff. Come on, Franson, let's go. See him through the screen there, right by the sink? Looks like the bird on that bulletin, all right. It is, I tell you. Well, let's talk to him. Hey, you. Over there at the sink. Come here. Yeah? What's on your mind, fella? What's your name? Demas. Bill Demas. Why? What difference does it make? I don't know. Yet. Don't mind coming over to the sheriff's office for a little chat, do you? Uh, if it's okay with the boss, it's okay by me. I don't think he'll mind. Come on. Hey, come back here. Stop! Stop! Get him, Glenn? No, he got away. Come on. Let's find out where he lives. He may try to get there and get a gun. You go find out where he lives. I'll wait for home and meet you in front. Okay. Obtaining the suspect's address, the officers arrive at Gordonio's room just as the telephone rang. Hello. Oh, Harry. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Just act natural, lady. Tell that bird on the other end of that line you'll do whatever he says. Yes, sir. Hello, Harry. Yes. Yeah. Okay, ten minutes. Sure. No, everything's all right. Bye. Harry Arax? Yeah. How'd you know? What did he want? Oh, he said for me to get his gun in his car and meet him down at the warehouse in ten minutes. Okay, get started. You're keeping that date. Ought to be here any minute. All set, Holman? Sure. There he is. Let him get almost the car. Let's take him. Take it easy, buddy. We've got you covered. What's coming off here? Get him up, Arax. No funny moves. That's to you, covers. You'll have to move faster than that. Let him have it, Dewey. Didn't seem to stop him, Dewey. Dewey, you're slipping. Took you three shots to get him. just a moment, we will hear additional facts regarding our program. It is highly significant that more police cars, ambulances, fire engines, and other public serving automobiles are powered with Rio Grande crack wherever it is sold than any other brand. The pilots of these city and county emergency cars, like an overwhelming number of California state and federal government officials, demand the best and get it with Rio Grande cracked. The gasoline that is first in public service and always in the tanks of cars owned by those who appreciate getting the most for their money. Would you like police car performance? Then get it. Drive into the nearest red and white Rio Grande station in the morning and give your car a head start with a tank full of Rio Grande cracked, the most highly and justly recommended gasoline that ever caught a public enemy. And again we hear... On the chief. Holman's bullet put Arax in the hospital, painfully but not seriously wounded. Ben Wood and Charles Guthrow brought him back to Long Beach where he was tried and convicted for the bur- murder of Bill McLean. He is now serving a life sentence in San Quentin. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Lentz. Calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 237 regarding a murder. Suspect in this case is now in custody. That's all. Rose and quit. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night. Rio Grande.